Are you a fan of video games, social deception, and reality shows? Introducing Survive Block Island, a reality competition show set in the world of Minecraft. I'm Trevor Collins, and I'll be hosting 12 of the greatest minds in video game entertainment as they compete in perilous challenges designed to test their skills and friendships and maybe their internet connections. Competitors will face challenges and eliminations. Winners will be granted safety, while weaker links will be voted off one by one. Ultimately, only one person will survive Block Island. Watch Survive Block Island available now by going to bit.ly slash survive block island. There's no such thing as a fish. There's no such thing as a fish. No, seriously, it's in the Oxford Dictionary of Underwater Life. It says it right there, the first paragraph, no such thing as a fish. Hello, and welcome to another edition of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with three other QI elves, James Harkin, Anna Chazinski, and Andy Murray. And once again, we've gathered round the microphones to share our favorite facts from the last seven days. So, in no particular order, here we go. James. Begin with you. Okay, yeah. My uh, fact this week is it was fashionable in New York at the end of the 19th century for ladies to wear live lizards as brooches. Wow. Nice. Yeah. With a pin on them? Well, actually, with a small leash, it seems. This was in um, an article in the archive of the New York Times about the RSPCA um, complaining about it. Unsurprising. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let me read you a, a few little bits. The lizards have been sold as chameleons. They were fastened to cushions by means of tiny collars and chains, and they have become quite a plaything for many people. Sometimes they were worn in the streets by women who had them attached to their bodices. It doesn't really give any more information. And was this popular? Was it, did a lot of people do it? I imagine it didn't last for very long, because the RSPCA and the New York Times got involved. Are there any other animals that we... Yes. Oh, known to <laughs> yes. Which really recently, maybe you saw this as well, and I don't really know why I don't remember this. Starting in 2006, there was a fashion designer who designed cockroach brooches. I think mainly because of the rhyming thing. But they became quite a popular thing, and it was a live cockroach on a brooch. And so they were decorated with like ornate jewelry and painted gold and stuff, and apparently they could last up to a year. Um, and they just crawl around. You. I think Paris Hilton got one. Women used to keep their uh, small pets in their muffs. They would decorate their muffs with jewels. And um, there were pets in there, and some, for a while it was like a status symbol. The larger your muff was, the more rich you were. So if you had, if you could get like a horse in there, a sixteen hander, then <laughs> that's impressive. People are going, she must be a princess or something. Muff that fits a horse, and people would be impressed. Yes. There was another in my memory book people used, but it's apparently in the Middle Ages, on record of the field of play, strapping a live chicken around the Uber. On your body. Oh yeah, yeah. that worked? No, no, nice. no, that's why I third of Europe back. Um, I think I've got a moment. They used to think that if you got bitten by a, by a snake, that if you um, put a live pigeon on the bite really? at the bottom of a pigeon, it yeah. would suck out the uh, venom. That's right. right. Yeah, and you would you would consistently use more and more pigeons until the final anus sucking a pigeon didn't die and then you knew you got the poison out. I have a very dim memory of in China so years ago doing some of the in the cage around their necks okay. which has drunk their love of blood. Yeah, that would happen in Europe. Please, that's it. But I can't imagine a cage small enough to be clear. There's a poem by John Dunn called yes. The Flea which is about the you know, the flea's bit and now it's bit and so well it's not the last thing it's got they all died of the plague soon after that. <laughs> Which isn't caused by rats again, right? I know this always comes around. Well, just on that subject of rats and you know us wearing lizards, um, there's a nice little mess. Donated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eurasian mine. That's okay. it. Yeah, it's so sweet. We'll put we should put a picture up on the website of them. I thought you were gonna say the reverse lizard thing. 
you <laughs> Is that what horses claim they're doing? <laughs> my great accessory, guys. Yeah. The fashion for humans in tight trousers and long boots remains. <laughs> I do really like the origin of, um, of fashions that are quite normal, though. Like, I didn't know, do you know how people used to wear wigs in the 17th century until the 19th century? And that was because Louis the 13th had male pattern baldness and so he insisted on wearing wigs all the time to conceal that. They used to wear really massive wigs, didn't they? Like yeah. really ridiculous with things in the wigs like a ship in full sail or a windmill with farm animals around it and this massive wig. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they would if there was something would happen in the in the news they would wear a wig which reflected what was happening in the news at the time. No. Yeah. And also they were quite expensive these wigs. Like if you got a really good one they were they were really status symbols and um, wig theft became a bit of a problem <laughs> and um, what they would have is you would walk across if you were a thief you'd walk across with a uh, basket and there'd be a young child inside the basket and then you would distract him for some reason then the child would pop out grab the wig pop back in into the basket and you'd run off oh how many of those awkward moments were there from cartoons where the children grab someone's hair and it turned out not to be a wig <laughs> and then <laughs> People going, that's definitely my mate crash that you're wearing on your head. <laughs> what were on wig theft? Someone, a lot of people in the 1910s and 1920s, there were bans on people bobbing their hair, whether that was locally oh. enforced. There weren't any governmental bans on it, but it was very discouraged. It seems to be far too racy. And at least one girl blamed her haircut on what they called Jack the Clipper. As in, someone someone just leaned out and chopped my hair. So a girl in the Bronx said that a highwayman had grabbed her and cut her hair off. That sounds like someone <laughs> where they thought of the name of the criminal yeah. before. <laughs> uh, just speaking of things that are banned, one of my all-time favourite QI facts. This is just a sentence. In 1367, French king Charles V prohibited the wearing of shoes shaped like penises. <laughs> Presumably because they were uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean. What happened was they would, the front of the uh, shoe would go very long and then they got longer and longer and longer and then they got more sticky-uppy and more sticky-uppy because it became more fashionable. And then people thought, oh, something long and sticky-uppy, why don't we make it into a penis? And they did that and then they had to ban it. It's just one of my all-time favourite facts. The Lady Gaga would not have fit in in that <laughs> Fact number two, this one's mine. My fact of the week is that the great codebreaker, Alan Turing, lost his buried treasure when he couldn't crack his own code. Oh. So, Alan Turing, um, for those, I guess, who don't quite know who he is. Yeah, he, he was a great mathematician and codebreaker for Gretchen Park. He was very instrumental in helping to crack things like the Enigma codes. And isn't he the, he's known as the father of modern computing. The um, Turing test. The Turing test is named after him. Yeah, so this is what happened. This was in 1940. Alan Turing got really scared of a potential German invasion. So he converted all of his life savings into two bars of silver which at the time were worth about 250 pounds. He wheeled them to some woods near Shenley, uh, and he buried them both uh, under the forest floor, one of them under the forest floor, one under a bridge uh, by the bed of a stream. He then made a code of where he buried it, and then he made a code of the code. And no one knows exactly how many codes of the codes of the codes he made, but he made a number so Do that no one... Do we have the codes? No. Because I imagine it would be X marks the spot, X equals Y. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, five years later, he returns with a metal detector in hand, uh, and he goes to the library and buried them, and he couldn't crack his own codes. And he kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. He did three expeditions to try and find his buried treasure, and each time he couldn't do it. And on top of it, in those five years, the landscape had changed. Someone had knocked down the bridge where he put it near the bed of the stream, and so he never found it. And so, unless someone has found it and not told anyone about it, Alan Turing's silver hoard is still buried somewhere in Shenzhen. But we don't know what his code was, do we? It was probably no. like, yeah, look at this bridge, and there's a poppy field. Oh, I think the man who helped crack the Enigma code probably is something a bit more complex yeah. there. Well, no, I probably take four hops towards the it left a, you reach the big It was dream. a double bluff. <laughs> <laughs> Three roly-polies forward. It's so oh. simple, it's complicated. That's actually also how he cracked the Enigma code in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know who if you find treasure in the UK do you know who he reports it to the local coroner wow, okay. so all he does is uh, gets dead bodies and treasure reported to him you know what you'd be hoping for <laughs> <laughs>
In France, you can't metal detect without a license to do so. Really? They're much stricter on it than we are. So I don't know whether that means there's much more buried treasure in France. Enthusiastic adventures going around the country. Yeah, there's something like 90% of treasure in the UK is found by people who metal detect with just amateurs. Yeah. Do you know how many coins you have to find to qualify as like a hoard? No, like, like a real Ooh. hoarder. You've got a hoard. Uh, so I reckon not many. I reckon. Yeah, it's two. Two. As two long as a hoard. As long as they're at least ten percent um, precious metal. Oh, they weigh great. two I've got, coins. I've got several hoards in my wallet. Then. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, they have to be three hundred years old. Too, sorry. I'm very thrifty, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm very old. <laughs> so are you, al- are you allowed to keep a coin? You're not allowed to keep a hoard. You're gonna have to. Yes. Coin. Yeah. Could you just say? Oh, I found a coin, and then, you know, walk away for a bit, and then walk back. Oh, another one. <laughs> 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 oh, nice. That is such a great what idea. A happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> I found a coin 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have to bring like, the law right now. <laughs> There's a great story of a book published in 1979 in England. It was kind of the world's first royal treasure hunt. It was called The Masquerade by Kit Williams. It's only about 20 years and the story doesn't really matter. It's the fact that every single page has hidden codes to the location of what the boy finds at the end of the story. This golden masquerade hair. Kit Williams buried it somewhere in the world, he didn't say where. And it's if you crack the code of the book, you find the masquerade hair. Someone eventually did, but it really, um, it really made people go insane. And so they became obsessed with it. It was a really, really hard code to crack. Um, people actually were um, sectioned for psychiatric help because they were so obsessed, and they were, they were just, uh, yeah, not getting to it. And unfortunately, the code was cracked by a couple. And they wrote the letter to Kit Williams to say that they found it. And the day before that letter had arrived, a neighboring person came to the house and said, Kit, I've got the answer, I know where it is, and then uh, dug it up. But they were told by one of Kit Williams' friends the location. So they cheated him to get it. So he told his friends the location. That's Somehow, a real like, he must have slipped in the pub or something. I don't know what it was. Damn it. Yeah, the person who did find it. Um, then tried to replicate the experience with a computer game, but um, it became so expensive to make it, and no one understood it once it came out. Then the company went bankrupt, and he had to put the masquerade hair itself up for auction. It went up for auction in Sotheby's. It was bought by an anonymous bidder, and since it was bought 30 something odd years ago, no one knows its location currently. Yeah, so it's still out there. Yeah. <laughs> Just talking about lost things. You can always lose a pin code somewhere. That happens all the time. And um, I saw an article in The Independent from 1996 which thought that in the future, instead of pin codes, people will use their fingerprints um, to say who they are. People obviously are a little, bit, a little bit worried about whether that would work or not. And so um, they managed to stop any worry by saying... A similar program in South Africa, which distributes payments to 450,000 pensioners, has resulted in only one attempt to use an amputated finger in more than six years. <laughs> so that sounds pretty safe. Wow. That's just the one they found out about. I mean, how many people with amputated fingers are there buried in someone's country? When they had the uh, when they had the lineup, they were like, point to the guy who did this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, time for fact number three, and uh, we're going to go to you, Anna. Uh, yeah, my fact is that in 2011, the largest sperm bank in the world stopped its sperm bank. Why? Well, you know, it was a the, it was it was Cryos International Sperm Bank in Denmark. Um, I think Denmark calls itself the sperm capital of the world um, because there. Is that <laughs> when you arrive at the airport? Yeah, it's it's the airport. <laughs> they're very proud of it. Everyone in Denmark, whenever they answer phone, has to say Denmark sperm capital of the world. True. <laughs> sperm, bank. sperm bank capital. Yeah, I don't think they just have really well endowed men. It's a sperm building society. I think it's more ethical. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lovely fact of uh, just of the idea of having that logo on at the airport. Uh, that in Scotland they spent the tourism board spent hundreds of thousands of pounds trying to refine a great slogan to apply to Scotland. And after a brainstorm that lasted for however long, hundreds of thousands of pounds, they arrived at Welcome to Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> the oldies are the goodies, aren't they? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, sorry, Anna, go on. Yeah, so there's a quote from Oli Shu, and he says uh, there, are, there are too many, so he runs the sperm bank in Denmark, the Cryos International Sperm Bank, and he said there are too many redheads in relation to Denmark. I do not think you choose a redhead unless the partner, for example, the sterile male, has red hair, or because the lone woman has a preference for red hair. And that's perhaps not so many, especially in the latter case. Um, anyway, it's obviously not fair because um, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with redheads. <laughs> Uh, as the QI view, and it also he also stopped accepting on the shoe from a lot of Scandinavians that they um, export a lot of their sperm internationally, and there's not so people like to have children that kind of look like them. Well, what a weird way of making your country bigger on the first map. Ten percent less sperm is that, and you can wrap them up in a little package, send them. You can receive it in the post, and then you can, like you can all, it's all DIY, order it online. What? So yeah. it comes from Richard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, it <laughs> so it's not over the liquids <laughs> amount a lot. <laughs> I don't, I don't I, think so. I know something went to show about This was in 2011. There's lots of girls who were trying to establish a sperm bank in the in North America. Because there aren't enough elements. And they're going to start coming uh, to the closely related to each other. Weak of the demon. Um, so 16 litres of elephant semen uh, were being kept in South African export office because American import had no idea mm -hmm. what to classify it as. There's a lot of bureaucracy in the USA. So it was just kept waiting there, frozen in limbo. Guys, I think it might still be there. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that was, that was four years ago. So there's 16 litres of semen. <laughs> 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 She wouldn't have declared. She would have just gone through the testing. Four through. No, over 100 mil. Very tricky. You'd have to have a long time off the channel. Yeah. She was in 90% of your son. Oh, that was. What do you mean? 90% of men in this fan have like either two heads or two tails, or multiple heads and tails, or like a coiled tail of broken tails. You mean superhero? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Superhuman. But yeah. a lot of these men actually Round get the clip point. so they can't have babies. <laughs> by a notorious villain known as Jack the Snapper. He's killing the superheroes before they're born. <laughs> um, for me, when I hear the word redheads as an Australian, I immediately think of our hats and stuff. In Australia, that's the leading brand of redheads. Redheads were originally in Australia. They got, um, they got out of the and so they were no longer an Australian product. And we have a guy in Australia called Big Smith, Big Smith, an iconic foods, and he's kind of Australia's Richard Branson. And um, he decided that he wasn't going to allow redheads to become the leading brand of Australian matches. So he created his own brand, which you can buy in shops. I think you can still buy them, and they're called Dickheads. Because um, <laughs> Dick Smith, Dickheads, and Dickheads became a hugely popular product in Australia. That reminds me of a window about Redhead Day in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a summer festival. It takes place each first weekend of September in the city of Rome. And um, all the redheads from the Netherlands are all along the have a lot of parties. It's very popular, uh, but in the first few years it wasn't so popular because it clashed with the local pumpkin parties. Those orange tattoos. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Why do redheads get such a hard time? Neither have I. I, think I always wanted to be redheaded. Yeah, it means you're special. Yeah. The Irish like redheads. There's a high demand still for redheads. Good. Not the Irish. They're still asking. Right. I'm very popular in Germany as well. There was a sex researcher called Professor Dr. Werner Habermel. And he said the sex lives of women with red hair is clearly more active than those with other men. With more partners, and having sex more often than the others. I find it quite interesting that the uh, human sperm cell is the smallest cell in the human body. Uh, egg, just the largest, I think. But the blue whale sperm is only a very tiny amount of blood. Yeah, it's totally random. I don't, I don't know, other people know why. They certainly don't know why the fruit flies are so big. And yeah, why have a small small business? Although I couldn't work, out, work this out. So the average male ejaculate 
is half a teaspoon. Ten um, cc. And that's where the band got its name from. Really? Really? I didn't oh. know that. Brackets. I haven't also heard of the band. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it contains 200 million sperm. If you lined up all the sperm in one ejaculate, it'd stretch six miles. <laughs> So you like you managed to get your sperm into one line six miles off. I don't. <laughs> yeah, you need a spatula or something. <laughs> the man who first discovered the man who first saw sperm under a microscope, who was called Van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, so he discovered them in 1677. He was very clear whenever he wrote about it, spoke about that the sperm that I found were not obtained by any sinful contrivance on my part, but were the excess which nature you provided me in conjugal relations. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I found is that it takes five people to get semen out of a vulture. <laughs> right. Is that your first hand experience? <laughs> I've got bad news for you, I've got only four of us. What am I going to do with this guy? Um, <laughs> No, one person takes the limbs, one takes the head, one takes the wings. The fourth person massages it back. So after the massage, the bird gets aroused, and then its uh, cloaca appears, which is like a, the sexual opening that most birds have. And then, so the fourth person then grabs the cloaca uh, between thumb and index finger, at which point the fifth person collects the semen in a glass funnel. Or receptacle. <laughs> once you've gone to that much effort, though, you may as well get this funnel. <laughs> That's the stag night. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, final fact of the show, and we head over to Andy Murray. My fact is that the English language has more words borrowed from one language. Why is it quite a long way away from one? Very long way away, yeah. Whereas Wales is quite close. Almost next door. Yeah. So maybe that is because... Um, Things in Hawaii are more unusual to us. Uh, things that are in Wales, we just use the English words for, perhaps. Well, possibly, but there, there seems to be a, a theory that it's actually snobbery. That oh, it was really? it was Anglo-Saxon snobbery that uh, that repressed the Welsh language, and it was it was suppressed for a, for a long time in the yeah. 19th century. Um, so this is a claim made by Dr. Philip Durkin, who's the author of Borrowed Work, and he's also the deputy editor of the OED. So he knows his stuff, and he's ranked a lot of different languages in terms of how many words from them ended up in the OED, uh, and Latin was suppressed. And French and um, but Hawaiian uh, manages to beat Welsh, as does Turkish and Icelandic. Hawaiian words that we have include things like. Uh, Hula hoop from Hula hoop, yeah. uh, Aloha, and Wiki, which yeah. means quick. Yeah. So Wikipedia. Yeah. Is if you um, go to Hawaii, I've been to Hawaii, and if you get a bus from the airport to wherever you need to go, they're called Wiki Wiki buses because they're quick. There's a bunch of words that uh, I think someone recently wrote a book on words that the English language used to have that we should bring back. The only one that springs to mind is fizzle, which used to mean to in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, it was a verb. It meant to break wind without making a noise, which we don't have anymore. But apparently, yeah, fizzle is where we get the word feisty from. Andy, you you actually have invented new words, haven't you? For you were one of the kind of silent authors of the modern after it was a book that what was it, Andy? It's a book for it's a book of things that there should be words for but aren't. So the original one was in um, the 80s, and it was w one of the words, and that was abilene, which is the pleasant coolness on the other side of a pillow. Which is lovely, because there's no words for that on a hot night when you take a pillow. Ah, oh, it's so nice. So all the, all the words in it, all the different real places in the world, the magical things that... Experiences that don't yet have to be worked to condense them. Exactly, yeah. So, so angram, an amusing anagram you can have with, it doesn't quite work, well, for example. <laughs> Or Danby Whisk, a bit of studio equipment that uh, you don't know what it's for, but it always means that you can't quite shut the door properly and you have to sort of jam it in. So that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. great. So, yeah. But going back to the Welsh thing, there are, there are several thousand people in Patagonia in Argentina who are descended from the Welsh and speak Welsh and Spanish as their two main languages. There are nearly as many Welsh speakers there as there are in Wales. That's bizarre. I really love it when there's language that's kind of preserved because you're in uh, isolated place being right on the coastline and obviously that's where some of the first people landed from the southwest coast and everyone there sp spoke with kind of a really thick Devonshire accent it's so weird so you're in North Carolina and people are talking like this too I'm not very good at that really <laughs> 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 um, Armstrong I think in the middle of the uh, Pacific and they all speak with a Gloucester accent yeah, so everyone cool. on the Brilliant. island oh, really? yeah. my favourite one is Gloucester which is definitely not for <laughs> Yeah, 
that's good. Very <laughs> The Hawaiians have a word for that, actually. Um, haole. Uh, ha ole or something like that, which means someone who's not from around there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are some um, other Hawaiian words which we should probably borrow in a bit similar to what we do with um, Afterlay. These are quite cool words. That's me. That's me. There's another one. It's Ulaia. Which means to live like a hermit what because of disappointment. Wow! That's oh. quite a good word. That's amazing. It's very specific as well. Yeah. The fact that you need a word for that implies that a lot of people are this hermit. <laughs> <laughs> they should meet up and not be hermits anymore. Do do you know, this is completely off topic. Yeah. Do you know that thing about the hermits in like the first to the fourth century? It was a fashion for um, people who were religious to go and live in the desert as a hermit. A few people did it. And then it became more fashionable, and more fashionable, and more fashionable <laughs> still. And then you have all these writings of these hermits. Not food, you're all these other hermits. It's just too many hermits. Yeah. I read the other day that one of the And they would go and talk to that hermit, and then they would let the problem sit with the hermit. The hermit would let the problem on their back. But sometimes, they would often they would uh, leave items in particular positions, so they look like the hermit was just he'd just gone out for a walk. You were showing off to your rich friends. Oh, I've got a hermit. Oh, he must be out he at the must moment. Be out like he's out socialising. Yeah. He's gone out on the I town. Mean, you don't really need to do that because all you have to do is say, "Oh, he's a hermit. He doesn't like to be disturbed." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. I can't believe there was a theory that it might make you less melancholy to go and rearrange the furniture in your fake hermit house. That sounds like I would walk out of that house and commit suicide immediately. <laughs> What's my life Yeah. Um, somebody the University of Leicester School of English was researching the hermit thing so that they were leaving reading matter in glasses. No. A bit like leaving Sherry out for Father Christmas. So, yeah, so to look like he was there and, yeah. I think that's quite charming. Yeah, yeah. And then they'd pretend to turn the pages and, like, put a bookmark on <laughs> a new page. Bookmark a bit every day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's really got a long way with Little Dorrit. <laughs> um, words that we do get, just going back to Welsh, Oh yeah, this has gone so far off topic. But words that we do get from Welsh include flannery, flummery, corgi, and dad. Yeah. That's pretty good better. But not mum. Uh, no, not mum. Isn't isn't ma the universal word for mother as a result of it's all universal. babies? But there is a place, and I think it's Georgia or Armenia, where the word for mother is dada. Yeah. It's one of very few places in the world. The corgi thing's quite interesting because it means that um, the correct plural of corgi is corgoon, because that's the way the Welsh <laughs> plurals are made. You have another thing about plurals. The one is um, that whenever I go to um, a sandwich shop, I get very annoyed if um, I ask for panini and they only give me one. <laughs> because panini is plural. It should be... And I always ask for a panino if I only want one of them. I'm going to be perpetually uh, disappointed. Uh, like the hermit. Such, oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> Never invite a QIL to any kind of shop. You're just going to be pedantic as hell on everything. Actually, there's no such thing as a fish. Get out of my fish and chip shop. <laughs> You're one of them QILs, aren't you? <laughs> Do you know what the state fish of Hawaii is? Uh, no. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the humu, humu, nuku, nuku, apu, aa. This is why we took from Hawaiian rather than from Welsh, because they've got so many vowels, and vowels are really easy to pronounce, aren't they? Ooh. The um, Hawaiian word huia, yo, ya, uh, meaning certified, has the most consecutive vowels of any word in current human speech. Wow. Just kind of sounds like they're drunk all the time, doesn't it? If you're just eliding too many vowels. It sounds a bit like they're corny. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we should wrap up. Just one final thing, Anna. One final thing. Yeah. Von etymology, the first known use of the word abracadabra, uh, was from the third century. Seems kind of weird to me because you would have thought it was like a modern, I don't know, it sounds like such a weird modern concoction, but yeah. it was used in the third century by a doctor who prescribed it as an anti malarial, one of the first proposed cures for malaria. And to, was, to say abracadabra? Or you, actually, you actually have to wear it around your neck in an amulet. Well, I like the idea of someone going to the doctors. He's like, oh, I'm feeling not very good. I think I've got malaria. Oh, I've got the one thing for you abracadabra! Abracadabra! <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I feel much better. 
Okay, that's it for our episode. That's all our facts. Thanks for listening to our show. If you want to get in touch with any of us about any of the things that we've said, you can reach us on our Twitter handles. James can be found on... At Eggshaped. Uh, Andy, you're on... At I'm on at Schreiberland. Anna is not on Twitter at the moment. Again, she is still refraining from joining, but we will get her one day. In the meantime, she sets up our fantastic qi.com slash podcast page where we're going to have links and videos and photos of all the things that we've spoken about over the course of this episode so if you go there and check it out that'd be great and we'll see you guys again uh next week so thanks for listening to no such thing as a fish goodbye Hi, I'm Ricky Gervais. Uh, my name's Steve Merchant. Uh, I'm Carl Pilkington. Uh, right. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to the World Technology, Technology Podcast. Can we do that end it? Just... <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, here we go, on the count of three. Okay. One, two, three. Uh... Oh, that's not very good. I'm over. One, fight. fight. You guys ready to go? Absolutely. All right. I should start off by thanking all of you because I usually have to do my interviews from a very small, cramped, smelly tube uh, in the newsroom, but I actually get to come down to the big studio today. Um, so thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for showing up. Is that because of us? Uh, yeah, just because of you guys. I get the studio. Well, you, you get more comfort because we're on. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. we're in a small don't you, don't little you... smelly booth, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, okay. Anyway. Um, I guess I should start off by asking, uh,